Lesson, wasn't it? Amen. Amen. Excellent. Excellent. Get this turned on here. Good to be with you this morning. Pretty good sized crowd. My soul, that's scary. Wee. I do better in prison, that's for sure. <laughs> Preaching in prison. Good to be home for a while. Amen. I feel like I fit in a little bit amongst the crowd here. We're all a little touched. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we, uh, good to have Brother Davey uh, teach the Word of God this morning. Uh, they hold a special place in our hearts. Uh, I don't know if you know it or not, but we were at a gas station one time in uh, La Follette, and this guy pulls in with scripture signs all over his car, and it was Davey Gillen. I walked up to him and I said, uh, Man, what are you, some kind of fanatic with all these signs in your car? I said, You're a little crazy, aren't you? And he said, No. He said, No, I just love the Word of God. And uh, I said, Where do you go to church? He said, uh, Trinity Baptist Church. I said, You do? I said, oh, Where's that at? And he told me where it was. I said, Well, praise God. I said, I need to come out there and uh, visit. And uh, that's, well, bam, here we are. <laughs> How about that? Uh, long story short, but uh, it was our scripture signs that led us. To back to, to, to Trinity. <laughs> it's crazy how the Lord does things. It's, it's amazing what God does, but pray for us. Now that we're here, you're stuck with us. Amen. I got no plans of going nowhere except straight up and uh, meeting Jesus. Amen. That's my next move is straight up. We're planted by the grace of God over in that mountain over there and uh, don't want to go nowhere. I just want to go up and see Jesus sometime soon. I believe that's going to happen, but pray for our ministry and pray for what God's called us to do and I uh, have no complaints. I wish I had a big sob story for you, but I know I don't have anything negative to say about what's going on in our lives. The Lord's just good to us and uh, blessed us beyond measure and much more than we deserve. Uh, we're going to Texas here on the 1st of April. We'll be traveling there. We'll be there for, I think, a little over two weeks, sweetheart, a little over two weeks in uh, seven different churches. So never been to Texas. Thank God I'll get to carry a gun down there. Amen. <laughs> Pack some heat and be, rub shoulders with guys that love doing the same. And it's kind of like being home here a little bit. Amen. And Brother Ben, and uh, it's just good to do. And uh, But uh, pray for those meetings down there. We're going to carry a whole bunch of scripture signs and just so soak them all over Houston and Austin and got meetings in San Antonio, Texas. So we're going to be out and about. And coming up in uh, April, we got meetings. The Lord's given us a number of different meetings this year. So we'll be in and out. Things are going to pick up and take off for us. But we've been able to be home. And uh, we've got the uh, satellite office downstairs working strong and full force down there. Brother J.D. and Brother Stephen are... Uh, steadily working down there and uh, I'm trying to play it by ear just how much they can handle. I, I load them up brother and uh, I can load them up even more than what they got but whenever they're ready and they, they seem like they're ready for more we give them more to do and it's just growing and growing and growing. We thank God for it. I know Miss Yvette does because they've kind of taken over some of what she's been doing for years and years and years peeling and picking and now uh, we got a cutter down there. They're ready to make scripture signs from the computer all the way on to the magnets so we thank God for that and what he's done uh, with our little uh, satellite office downstairs. We praise the Lord for those two guys and thank God for them. 
Um, got all kinds of things I could say, and uh, I suppose I wish I was preaching on the rapture, but I'm not. <laughs> and uh, I wish I was preaching on heaven, but I'm not. I'm trying to be obedient to the Lord, what He wants this morning, and uh, just pray, and uh, God will give us exactly what we need this morning. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and uh, hopefully most of you already know what's in 1 Samuel chapter 17, a very familiar portion of Scripture that we've all known and loved for years and years. But uh, there's a couple, a few truths in here that I'd like to try to bring out this morning with the help of the Lord and um, by His amazing grace as usual and see what the Lord has for us. Just not, my, my messages are, are never deep, so it won't take long to get the point of the message this morning. But uh, pray for me and uh, pray for Brother Dilbert. I miss him when he's away and I think about him, pray for him. I've prayed for him today and yesterday and this past week for his meetings down there. And uh, over there, up there in Montana, had a number of preachers call, and I asked them to pray and uh, for the meeting. So we get settled here. Pulpit's never big enough for my notes. <laughs> I could have a pulpit eight feet long, hey amen, and fill that dude up with notes <laughs> and uh, see what the Lord gives. We'll try and get our thoughts together here. And uh, I'll tell you what, why don't I ask uh, uh, Brother Bird, why don't you, you pray? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, of course, it's the story of David and Goliath. And um, I want to bring out, by the grace of God, a few points through this passage. We cannot read it all and won't read it all today. But it's a great story, true story from the Word of God. And let's pick it up with the narrative there in uh, chapter 17, verse 4. Chapter 17, verse 4. And uh, I may have touched on some of this stuff in the past, but let's just touch it again. Uh, it says, And there went out uh, a champion, a champion, out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cupids in a span and had a helmet of brass upon his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had graves of brass and upon his legs and the target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. So you've got Goliath here. He's coming out. Of course, you know what he's coming out for. He's coming out to do battle against uh, the nation of Israel there and, um, of course, David. But it says there, it says, And there went out a champion. That's strike one, let's say. Then verse 8, it says this. He begins to talk, he says, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man. There's his first mistake. <laughs> he got a man, all right. For you and let him come down to me. If we be able to fight with, if he be able to fight with me and kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words, the Philistine uh, were dismayed. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. I heard one guy said, this is one of the first terrorists in the Bible. <laughs> You've got Goliath standing there terrorizing the nation of Israel. Now you've got ISIS today. You had Goliath back then. I mean, a big guy dressed up, standing up there, and uh, uh, an amazing looking character, I suppose, a frightening looking man, very huge of stature there. But it says there he was a champion. Take your Bible now and there and look in, uh, let's look at verse 20. 
Let's jump down to verse 20. It says, And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran uh, into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. Notice it says, and David heard them. <laughs> David didn't miss anything he was saying, but it says there uh, in strike one was, there come up a champion. In verse 23 it says, uh, there came up the champion. And now take your Bible and turn to verse 43. Let's pick it up there. Strike one, strike two. Three times in the Bible the word champion is used. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse 43. It says, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give the flesh, thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. He's a lot of talk, isn't he? And David said to the Philistine, Now, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day the Lord uh, deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give thy carcass on the, of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and, of, and to the wild beasts of the earth, and all, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel." And all the assemblies shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose, uh, I want to make note there, verse, notice verse 47 and 48 there, and I want to make a mention there uh, in between those verses in a moment. Uh, in between 47 and 48, an event takes place. Uh, and, ver and it came to pass there, in verse 48, when the Philistines arose and came Came and drew nigh to meet David, that uh, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in the bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. And David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut his head off, cut his head therewith and the Philistines saw that notice their champion was dead and they fled. Friend you got a real problem when your champion is dead. Uh, three times in the word of God it says they're a champion, the champion, then it says their champion and uh, I want to say this that friend if you put all your stock in a particular champion on this earth uh, uh, they're going to drop like flies than they are today. The Bible says there that they went out a champion. A cha the champion, their champion was dead and they fled. Uh, it's a big problem when your champion's dead, buddy. And uh, this world looks to the champions of this earth. They look to the champions in Hollywood and the sports world. Uh, they look to their champion old Dale Earnhardt. Say, where's Dale Earnhardt today? He's dead, friend. That's where Dale Earnhardt is. Uh, where's Michael Jackson today? He's dead, friend. That's where Michael Jackson is. Where's Elvis Presley today? He's dead. That's where Elvis Presley is. Where's funny man Robin Williams today? Uh, friend, he's dead today. Where's Joan Rivers today? They're dead today, friend. Their champions are dropping like flies. And they look for someone to be their champion. Uh, you have a real problem when your champion dies. This world, they're looking for champions. It seems like nothing shakes them. Uh, God can smite down and take their champions and eliminate them one by one, but the world just keeps trekking on. They just keep moving on down the road. It seems like this thing's on a track going straight to hell and nothing seems to be stopping it or uh, uh, slowing it down in any way. And no matter what the Lord throws at this place, no matter what the Lord does to the United States of America and the world, and the world just
just keeps moving on and chugging down the road of life like a mighty train. Uh, Jesus Christ, thank God, he's our champion. Amen. I mean, we've got a champion today, buddy. Uh, no one's ever going to take him down. They tried to take him down. The devil tried to take him down. But friend, he could never take him down, thank God. Uh, he's uh, the only true champion in this life. Jesus Christ is the champion of this life, thank God. Uh, he's the champion in the Old Testament. He was the champion in the New Testament, thank God. Uh, he's the champion in the eternity past. He was the champion in eternity future. Uh, he's the champion of the saints in the days gone by. He's the champion of, for the saints in the nasty now now, thank God. He's the champion of all my battles in my past. He's the champion of all, the, all my uh, battles in my future, thank God. Jesus Christ is our champion today. I'm not looking for another. I'm not waiting for someone else to come, brother. I'm looking for him to come, thank God. Uh, thank God he did come and send the comforter, amen. Uh, he's with us today. Uh, he can be my champion and your champion every single day of your life. Amen. He's the champion of my sorrow. He's the champion of my stress. Uh, you ever have stress? Big word today, isn't it? <laughs> Seems like everybody's got stress. Guess what? We got a champion. Amen. He can whip your stress, amen. He can take your stress just like that. You, you claim a verse or grab a verse or get a hold of a verse of scripture there in the word of God. Uh, friend, he can, he can be the champion of your stress. But our problem is we just let our stress roll on and forget, hey, we got a champion that can take care of our stress. He's the champion of my sickness. He's the champion of my wife's sickness too, brother. We've had some serious sickness in our life. It come and went, brother. Say, what happened? The champion came by. <laughs> the champion Jesus. Hey, when some doctor come by, Jesus come by. And he'll touch you, friend. He can heal you and take care of you. And we're not going to set up a, a healing line today. But brother, uh, we've got the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Uh, he will take care of you in those times. Well, I'll tell you what, he does take care of us. In our sickness and our sorry attitude, our sin, sick, selfish lifestyle, he'd take care of that. He's a champion of that too. He's a champion of my failing finances. Hey man, about the time you think you don't got enough, whew, here comes some food. Here comes some gas. Here comes some of this. And here comes some of that. And here comes a friend to say hi. Here comes a word. Uh, just in due season, brother, uh, somebody nice come by. A kind word or somebody uh, just sweeps through and it's the Lord. You know it's God come through your life. It's the Lord, our champion. He's a champion of my unfaithful friends and my foolish decisions. He's a champion of the fears and I have in this life. You ever have fears? I have them. If they ever come up with a pill for fear, I'm taking a bunch of them. Amen. <laughs> I got fears left and right, brother. I wake up with fear. I go to bed with fear. Amen. It seems like I, I just wish they'd come up with a pill. I will give me a I'll be a prescription junkie. Amen. They come up with a fear. A pill that says, uh, 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 you will not fear. I'm going to take a bunch of them. But Jesus, he's the champion of my fears. All of a sudden, he just comes by and I don't have no fear no more. I get reading this old Bible here and drifting through the pages of this book right here and my fears seem to, to fly. He's a champion of my lazy, sorry flesh. He'll get me out of bed in the morning. He's a champion of my lack of sleep. He's a champion of my loneliness. He's a champion of my life. He's a champion of all life. Brother, he's a champion of the cross, thank God. He's a champion of the grave, thank the Lord. He's a champion of the, the devil, amen. He's a champion of hell, brother. I mean, you couldn't look for a better a champion in this world. But the world, they seek and look all through the earth for a champion, somebody that's going to lift them up and somebody's going to satisfy them just the right way. But friend, they're never satisfied. Their drugs can't satisfy them. The alcohol can't satisfy them. Their, their sinful lifestyle, it cannot satisfy them. Brother, they're looking for a champion, I'm telling you. It's a champion that they're looking for. But it seems like no matter what the Lord does, they won't take heed and look to their champion that the Lord sent them. 1986, the Challenger blew up and exploded on takeoff. Seven astronauts were dead. That didn't seem to phase them. 2001, September 11th, 9-11, 3,000 souls perished in New York City. That didn't seem to phase them. Trucking right along. 2003, the Columbia Space Shuttle burns up to pieces, coming on re-entry, seven dead. 2011, uh, floods hit the US, U.S. to the tune of uh, $2.4 billion. You would have thought they'd say, wow, maybe there's a God up there trying to shake us up a little bit. But you know what? They just sent a bunch of relief in, sent a bunch of money down there. and They didn't, they didn't even acknowledge that it could be God doing that kind of thing. 
2012, uh, Hurricane Sandy hits the U.S., 75 billion, 147 dead. 2013, tornadoes ripped through America to the tune of $2 billion. 2014, tornadoes through, uh, ripped through America to the tune of $1 billion, 35 dead. And uh, last year, a, a 777 uh, just vanished off the earth, amen. And man, now you'd think that they'd wake up and say, hey, so somebody's trying to get our attention down here. But you know what? They don't. They don't. They just truck right along. We are the champions. Uh, the the uh, song uh, group, uh, the Queen. Amen. I'm suspicious of that already. Anybody call their group Queen? Brother, I'm suspicious. Of, I've paid my dues time after time. I've done my sins but uh, committed no crime. Sure they have. Amen. They're sinners. We are the champions, my friend. We are the champions. We are the champions. No time for losers because we are the champions of the world. What nonsense. Muhammad Ali, he said he was a champion. That guy, he might have been, he was a great boxer. I'll give him that. I wouldn't want to fight him. Amen. <laughs> he said, I'm not the greatest. He said, I'm the double greatest. Humble little fellow, wasn't he? <laughs> not only do I knock him out, I pick the round. He said, I'm the boldest. I'm the prettiest. I'm the most superior. I'm the most scientific. I'm the most skillfulest fighter in the ring today. He said, I'm the king of the world. He said, I'm the greatest. I am Muhammad Ali. <laughs> I shook up the world. I float like a butterfly. I sting like a bee. I am the greatest. I am the king of the world. He said, I am pretty. I am pretty. I'm a pretty black man. I'm a pretty bad man. Uh, you heard me. I am a bad man. That's Muhammad Ali, but he got beat up five times. Not so bad, hey amen. <laughs> Went down. But you know, there's something here in this passage I want to bring your attention to. And it's something I overlooked for years. And it's back there in verse 49. Look there in 1 Samuel 17, 49. Now Goliath is out there on the front lines. He's challenging. He's fearful. But he's got a problem. He ran into a man. Look what it says there in verse 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and with spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. Period. That's what David said to him there. Then verse 48. And it came to pass, when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. Notice very carefully what it says. That the stone sunk into his forehead. And he fell upon his face to the earth. I believe through this passage here we can deduct a few things that uh, there was a period of time here from 47 to 48 that Goliath could have repented. But he didn't, did he? We know the story. We know the rest of the story like Paul Harvey says. We know what happened. But he could have. He had an opportunity to consider his ways there. There was a period of time before Goliath fell that you might say it just hadn't sunk in yet. Hey man, isn't that right? It hadn't sunk in yet. But there's a period of time there where it did sink in. <laughs> say what was it? It was a stone. It was a stone that come from David. It was a stone that David slang intentionally to take down Goliath. But there was a period of time between verse 47 and 48 there that uh, old Goliath, there was a time to repent. But he just hadn't sunk in. Say, Brother Slapey, what do you mean? It just hadn't sunk in yet. What hadn't sunk in? The impending judgment of God. Yeah. There was a period of time there where David was getting ready knowing what David's going to do. He knew what steps he was going to take to take down Goliath. He already had it in his mind. He's going to sling a stone at that boy. He's going to take him down with a stone. There was a period of time where the impending judgment of God had not dropped on old Goliath yet, but it was about to. It just hadn't sunk in yet. You know what's wrong with this world? I mean, you've got a man here named Goliath. He's a giant. He thinks he's cool. He thinks he's the champion. He's confident. Sounds like somebody I know in the White House. Amen. He's convinced. He's cocky. He's calm. He's Mr. Cool. He's collected. He's cussing, but... <laughs> He don't know yet.
yet, but it's coming. The impending judgment of God's coming on this earth, friend. It don't matter who's in the White House. It don't matter what's going on over there in the Middle East. The impending judgment of God. Brother, God's up there in heaven. The judgment of God looms over this country right now. And brother, it hangs in the balances. And as God looks down on this earth, don't you think the Lord's asleep for one minute? Don't you think he's not doing nothing about it, friend? It's all in the will of God. It's all in the great plan of God to bring forth the prophecies in the Word of God. Amen. It's coming. The impending judgment of time of God is coming. God said in Exodus 12, verse 12, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. A time had come, a chance to reconsider his way before it had sunk in. It just hadn't sunk in yet. The judgment of God looms and hangs and suspended over the world today. I mean, uh, the Bible says there in Haggai uh, verse, uh, chapter 1 verse 7, Thus saith the Lord, consider your ways. I wonder if we would do that today. Me, you know, it might do you a whole lot of good to consider where you're at today. Amen. Consider your, where you're at in the will of God and consider where you're at in the walk of God and uh, the, uh, what God wants you to do in this life. Consider, say why? I, I'll tell you why, friend, because God sits up in heaven and brother, I'll tell you what, the judgment's coming. Uh, this time, brother, it just hadn't sunk in yet to some of us. Amen. Brother, if it sink in... <clears throat> I'll guarantee you we'd act differently. Amen. We'd go out there with a different vision. We'd go out there with a different burden. We'd go out there with a different desire to serve God and love God and get in the will of God and, and just love each other and care for one another. Say why? Because it just hadn't sunk in yet to some of us. Amen. Did it happen to Goliath? Oh, sure it did. We know the story. We know the rest of the story. It did sink in. Right there, buddy. He rose up against God or the will of God. But there was a time for him to reconsider his way before it sunk in. He rose up against God or the will of God. And I want to say this. You don't challenge God. Oh, I do a little sin. That's what Brother Jack was talking about Wednesday night. I'll do just a little bit. I'll, I'll toy with this sin and I'll not do this. And I, I might come to church. I might not come to church, friend. And you don't mess with God. You know that? Brother, you better find out what God's will is for your life. You better get involved in God's will for your life. You better find out where the church is going and the church is heading and get involved in your local church and just sell out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, friend, it's coming. You don't rise up against God or the will of God. The Bible says there, and it came to pass that the Philistine arose and came nigh to meet David. I want to say this. I want to say Goliath's fate was directly related to Goliath's decisions. He made a decision. God lets you make decisions. God lets me make decisions. He's let me make decisions my whole life. And I regretfully look back on so many things and say, boy, I blew it. Oh, man, I blew it, God. God, don't look on my sin. Have mercy upon me. Forgive me of my sin, friend. Uh, you can do, you can have that mercy today. I mean, it's extended to all men. Say, why, say, why won't someone come to the altar and get saved today? Because it hadn't sunk in yet. The judgment of God, friend. There's a judgment going to fall on every lost person out there. It's called the judgment of hell, friend. Uh, someone's going to die and go to hell if they don't get born again, if they don't get saved. Say, well, they say, well how come they don't think anymore about it? Because it just hadn't sunk in yet. It's coming. Yeah. Hell's real. Hell's coming for somebody. Hell might be coming for somebody sitting in these walls today. Some lost child or adult or some young teenager that really are just tripping through life and not considering their ways and not thinking about God. Friend, uh, your decision is going to come between you and God someday. What you do. Goliath's fate was directly related to Goliath's decisions. Go ahead. You know what's hard for parents? When they look at kids and they know they're on the wrong path. Oh, I have to break the heart of a parent, break the heart of an aunt and their uncle and grandma and grandpa. And man, it breaks my heart when Kimber gets mad. <laughs> Amen. I see that little pterodactyl get, start to screaming. And boy, I tell you what, I look at that, I say, girl, that ain't the right way now. It's okay. Grandma and grandpa got your best interests at stake. It's going to be okay, you know. You know, I, what I wish someday is when that little girl grows up, you say, how's she talk now? Yeah, yeah. I wish I could understand the little things. She's two years old and she, she'll, she'll say shoe. She'll say toe. 
mean, she'll say little baby talk, but I, I can't wait for the day when I can try to talk and reason with that little. But you know, even when they become able to talk and reason, uh, I'll tell you what, it'd do a, a bunch of kids a lot of good if they just go to mom and dad and say, hey mom, what's wrong with my life? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great if kids would do that, teenagers? Say, hey, Dad, take a look at my life. What's wrong with my life? Where can I make some changes? Where am I messing up? What am I supposed to do as a Christian? What am I supposed to live? How am I supposed to live? Oh, no. Say, why? Because that old stubborn will. You know, Goliath had such a stubborn will, he didn't care what David said. It mattered him one bit. Say, why? It just hadn't sunk in yet. Oh, it's coming. Oh, it's coming, buddy. So I'll get around it. No, you won't, buddy. You ain't going to get around it. I don't care, Mom said. It's coming, friend. You mark it down, buddy. You mark it down. Judgment's coming in your life. Hey, God will take you down. He'll slap you down. Not think twice about it. Scary, isn't it? Scares the tar out of me, buddy. That's why you need to repent about every other hour or so and get right with God. I look at my sin. I think, man, Lord. My soul, why do you even look my way? Amen. You just got to start talking to God every day and keep real, real good lines of communications wide open with the Lord. Yes, Say why? It's coming. Just hadn't sunk in yet. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the Bible says. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. You know how I know Goliath didn't fear God? Boom, buddy, he went down. In a moment, a twinkling of an eye, plop, he's gone. Can happen like that. Death comes like that. Events happen like that. Car accidents happen like that. Bombs go off like that, brother. Uh, you talked about Stephen back there. I guarantee you, he knows something about bombs going off. Or you get a man over there in Iraq and Afghanistan, buddy, and boom, it happens like that. Judgment falls. Now, I'm not saying it's always judgment. I'm telling you, that's what the message is today. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's God trying to deal with some folks. And it says there in verse 23 of 17, And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. So I'm going to go out there with my buddies. I'm going to go out there with my family, and they're not living for God, and my friends don't really live for God. And we're going to go out there and talk and have fun and have a big time. But the Bible says there, and David heard them. He heard what came out of that old boy's mouth. Heard every word. Took him down. Took him way down. The day came when God had enough out of his mouth. Had enough out of his rebellion. Saw enough of the hot air. Enough of the, 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 the disdain for God and the things of God. And the judgment of God fell. 294 times judgment is mentioned in the Word of God. For the Lord loveth judgment. Psalm 70, uh, 37, 28. For I the Lord love. <laughs> Those verses scare me. When God loves judgment, that bothers me, friend. There's verses in that Bible right there. They bother me bad. And I love God. I, I, I profess to. I believe I do in my heart. But there's something about God. I think about what he could do to me tonight. We're on the way home. It'd just take one semi just to drift a little bit. Just to talk, just do a little texting or look down at a deer. And here we are going home. I often think about those things. The impending judgment of God is suspended over the ungodly decisions of mankind. There is a way which seemeth right on a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. God's real serious about his work. He wants to get it done and mark it down. You better not get in the way of his work. I think Trinity's got a work going on here. I love it. I get to be just a tiny little part of it. Brother Stephen, Brother Josh, man, we're all kind of in cahoots together now. <laughs> I kind of like it. But then I got Brother David. He's teaching school and teaching in uh, football classes and other people are doing a host of other stuff. But there might be two or three in here that hadn't got on board yet. 
Don't get in the way of what God's doing is what I'm trying to tell you this morning. You say, why? Because maybe it just hadn't sunk in yet. You say, what? The judgment of God maybe hasn't sunk in yet. It's coming. It's coming. Say, what is it? It's a rock. It's a rock. Say, what rock is that? It's Christ. It's the Lord Jesus Christ to whom coming as a lively stone, the Bible says. 1 Peter 2, 4, 6, 7, and 8. A lively stone disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, the Bible says, elect and precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Thank God. Uh, unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which, are, uh, which be disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. A stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at thy word. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, and that rock was Christ. So I'll escape it. No, you won't. Mark it down. You ain't going to escape it. It's coming. It's coming. There's a day. It's coming, friend. Mark it down. Say, well, say, well, why do I go out here and I just kind of forget about the message when we leave the building here? We forget about uh, what we did in church and what the Sunday school lesson was about the wells of water and the great uh, illustrations that were given and the preacher will preach. Isn't it amazing how hard it is to, uh, I got embarrassed here a while back. I got the home and I had a, we had a, a guest at the house and they said, uh, what did the preacher preach on this morning? You know what? I got embarrassed. <laughs> Don't that bother you? Yes, sir, man. I get home and Brother Judd, I get to thinking, man, what did Brother Dilbert preach about? It was good, too. <laughs> I got to thinking, man, I remember sitting in that pew right there. I get to thinking, man, that's good preaching. Boy, that's good preaching. My heart gets to pounding. I get to feeling like little Kimber down there when she gets in a tissy. I get to thinking, man, if he says, Jesus, I'm going to jump up and run, run, run around the block. I'm going to lose my mind and go crazy because, man,